thank you for the introductions. Um, as Zina said, um, I'm Leah, um, and I recently completed my PhD supervised by the lovely Zina, and I'm currently working for the CBA. Um, I'm really pleased that Zina and I put this session together because I'd really like to spend it reflecting on my own research um, and how it led me to where I am today and to the work that I'm doing with the CBA. But I will just preface, preface that with the fact that I did actually put this presentation together in classic conference style very late last night. So if there's any errors on the screen, just ignore them. Um, so my thesis focused on engaging multiple publics in developer-funded archaeology from the field to the final report. And I explored both post-excavation and on-site public engagement for my PhD. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about one of the major research studies that I conducted for my thesis, um, which focused on physical and intellectual obstacles that exist within archaeological literature and outputs that impede our understanding of sites and find. Additionally, I'll be talking about Puns2 project um, at the CBA and, and how I became involved in that project. So, the CBA published the Public Needs Survey, PUNS, in uh, 2001, um, and this was to address issues within archaeology reports and publications. Uh, at the time, there was widespread satisfaction among archaeologists with reports and publications, and they acknowledged that the electronic revolution also requires us to recognize that publication and dissemination are no longer necessarily the same thing. The majority of the UK community felt that fieldwork publications were not an appropriate means uh, to disseminate information to the public as they were too technical, too difficult to obtain and too costly. Um, instead, respondents suggested that a more appropriate way to target wider audiences were outreach events, open days, museum exhibitions, popular audience publications, television and radio programmes. Well, it's been 25 years, almost 25 years, uh, the original band survey and I've just, sorry, let me go back. Second. Go. Um, yeah, almost 25 years since the original plan survey. Um, and in that time, the world has changed a great deal. Our ability to access and engage with information has moved into a digital sphere um, that brings with it a lot of interesting and useful ways of reaching new audiences. Um, there's also been a great deal of research into the problematic nature of great literature reports and monographs that has demonstrated their potential for improving public um, understanding of archaeology in that time. However, um, a great deal of those studies, much like the original pan survey, focus on how, uh, for goodness sake, I'm trying to scroll down on my notes, but I'm not quite sure how to do that. If there's anyone from tech to help me. Cut me off at the bottom. I can riff, yeah. <laughs> I'll just start rapping. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so yeah, the focus has predominantly been on how the archaeological sector think about archaeological reports. But we're moving away from that and we're shifting toward wider audiences and what they think about publications, grey literature reports, and alternative outputs. So uh, for my PhD thesis, um, I wanted to know what the wider public and those within the archaeological community thought about archaeological literature and outputs to find out what changes can be made today and how public experiences of archaeological outputs can be improved years on from the original survey. So back in 2019, which already feels like a very, very long time ago now, pre-pandemic, um, I took it upon to find out. Uh, to do this, I saw public feedback um, in small group settings through focus groups. Uh, I had 11 focus groups, which were conducted with a total of 50 participants. Um, and the groups chose the participation in the study for several categories. Public, background in archaeology, whatever, archaeology undergraduate students, uh, professional archaeologists, and volunteer archaeologists. So unlike the pun survey, I really wanted to target um, audiences who have no background in heritage or archaeology whatsoever. So I provided participants with a grey literature report, formal publication, such as a monograph, and an archaeology comic strip, courtesy of John Swagger, who we're going to be hearing from soon, uh, to look more at visual aspects of communicating archaeology. So the focus group questions explored several key themes, uh, being local and placemaking, 
perceived audiences versus actual readership, language and presentation barriers, cost and availability, authorial voice and representation, which Zena had covered fantastically, um, and finally, archaeological comic strips. Um, so I'm going to cut to the chase, <laughs> as the aim of the study was to ascertain whether improvements could be made to archaeological literature to improve public engagement with developer-funded archaeology um, in a post-excavation setting. Um, and the study identified several methods for achieving this. One of the key questions I asked was whether participants knew where to find reports and publications, which seems like a really simple question, but it's a really important one. Um, and as you can see, uh, participants were mostly unaware of how to physically access resources. Um, those that were aware of how to access them were obviously archaeologists and volunteers, but if the wider public are not aware of these resources existing or where to find them, um, are they really publicly accessible? Uh, so the ADS is obviously often cited as really an is a very useful resource for archaeologists and the public alike for accessing archaeological information on sites throughout the UK. Um, but without much knowledge of those kind of resources, the wider public cannot physically access that kind of information. Um, so this was further demonstrated by the majority of non-archaeologist participants within my focus groups having not read any archaeological literature prior to the focus group taking place. Participants suggested they were far more likely to access free literature reports rather than publish monographs in the future, which was quite a result. Um, and that was essentially attributed to great literature reports being free of charge. So there isn't really an issue in terms of, there were obviously barriers that exist within those reports, but not a lack of desire to engage with them. Um, it's just simply an unknown resource. Um, and that too, in terms of cost and charge, demonstrates the financial barriers have a huge impact to engagement with archaeology, but also highlights that if there were more public awareness, um, then the AES would be a really useful resource uh, for the wider public. A further barrier was the technical language um, and presentation of both research reports and publications. It's not used really to me. Um, but recommendations from participants for reducing the technicality of the literature was made and the suggestions that the literature was targeted towards professional archaeologists due to the technicality of the contents was something that was obviously identified back with PUN 2001 and is the case today. Participants recommended including a glossary of terms, which is quite a simple additional thing to do. Um, with pictures of archaeological processes, finds and site maps, if they're not already included. Um, having said that, the majority of participants said that they would use online repositories to access free literature reports in future, showing there's a real desire to engage with them, regardless of the barriers that are currently posed. So I think that was a really important outcome of that study. And as noted, um, one simple measure to improve engagement alone would be making the existence of these these. Uh, resources and open access materials more well known. When a participant was local to a site that they were provided material with um, or grew up nearby, um, the enjoyability of the report drastically improved, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and that was largely attributed to possessing a local knowledge of the area that assisted them in visualizing the site. That was one of the key outcomes. Um, so having a more in depth knowledge of the landscape really helps to improve an understanding of the actual written material in front of them. Um, but more could be done to improve understanding for non-local readers. And these report, reports clearly rely heavily on prior knowledge. Um, the inclusion of pictures, site maps, glossary terms can really help to improve intellectual access, albeit not without an attempt to remove language barriers and other physical access barriers. I have actually got more notes on here, but I can't actually get to them. So I'm just going to skip over the things I already wrote down because I forgot. <laughs> anyway, this brings me to pun two. Um, so in collaboration with MOLA and with funding support from Historic England as part of the 21st Century Ch Challenges in Archaeology project, CBA have begun the Public User Needs, Sur User Needs Survey 2, um, which follows on from the previous pun survey in 2001. So in November of last year, um, I passed my PhD viva, Yamie, 
Um, and in the same week, um, I joined the CBA as their PUNS2 researcher. Um, so a pretty good time for me, um, uh, as I just spent years doing my own mini kind of PUNS2 uh, for my PhD and advocating for another. So here we are. It was kind of cosmic. So what's different this time, I hear you ask? Well, the original PUNS project explored the use of traditional archaeological outputs. So what we were talking about here, mod graphs, grey literature reports, and other formal publications and focused on what the archaeological community really felt about them. But PUNS2 differs in two really important ways. PUNS2 will survey anyone and everybody. Um, we, didn't, we don't simply want to know what just the archaeological sector thinks, and we want to reach and hear from a broad range of audiences, which will include people who may or may not be interested in archaeology whatsoever and may not even identify as a user or an engager of archaeology. So the purpose of this is to find out how we can improve all archaeological output whether traditional or not, to reach new audiences and encourage more people to engage with archaeology. A secondary aspect to this is that the world has changed a lot since 2001, and with our access to, to a much more digital sphere, um, there's far more ways of engaging with archaeology than there were when we originally ran puns back in 2001 that involve social media. So that's another branch of puns too that we're really, really focusing on, is how social media incorporates communication of archaeological content. So non-traditional outputs can come in lots of different forms and formats. Um, from the images on the screen, um, I'm sure you're probably already aware of a lot of them um, and can likely think of lots more examples. But you'll see we've also got TV programs, comics, which we'll touch on later in this uh, presentation, um, digital and non-digital lectures. But there's also video games, which is something that I also really want to talk about, um, such as Assassin's Creed, which is actually taken uh, from uh, Assassin's Creed on the screen, um, Odyssey, which features a lot of the Nossos Minen Palace um, inspired content. So the difference between the outputs that the ADS provides access to and other examples on the screen is a great deal of intellectual accessibility. So non-traditional outputs tend to be a lot easier to understand, um, are sometimes often quite enjoyable compared to our traditional outputs, but might not necessarily be seen as additional ways of engaging with archaeology. They are. They are ways of engaging with archaeology. And it's important that we start to acknowledge that more as we move forward um, towards the future of archaeology. So what do we hope to gain from puns to research? I hope you enjoy my lovely notebook meme. Firstly, uh, we aim to reach and engage with a diverse range of audiences through our online survey, in-person workshops, and semi-structured interviews. So the data that we gather from those activities is really going to help us to understand how we can reach people who haven't engaged with archaeology before, how we can improve archaeological content to make it physically and intellectually accessible for wider publics, and what people hope to actually gain from archaeological content. We need to start asking that question. Um, and how do we let them know it exists? So PUNS2 is all about inclusivity and accessibility. So we aim to help to provide practical guidance and recommendations for those who produce archaeological content and outputs so that archaeology can become more accessible to more people. So one of the first steps to making puns to more accessible for a wide on specialist audience was to find a new identity for it because puns to is not very informative and it's a bit dry. So the CBA is keen to really embed young people's insights into our organisation and outreach projects. So our goal is to remove barriers to young people's participation and facilitate a youth-led approach through our Youth Advisory Board. So the Youth Advisory Board, youth advisory board um, is made up of 12 people aged 18 to 25, representing young people from different backgrounds across the UK. Um, we also have a young associate network, uh, which, allows us, which allows anyone aged 16 to 25 to stay in the loop with things happening at the CBA and within the sector with no minimum time commitment. So the reason I'm telling you this is because the Youth um, uh, Young Associate Network, I help do a workshop uh, with a group of seven of young associates with the aim of finding identity of funds too that's understandable, accessible for a wider non-specialist audience, but also relates to archaeology and heritage. So these were some of the concepts that we came up with. <laughs> some of them are obviously quite funny um, and enjoyable, which is what you know it's all about. So. But we didn't end up going with any of these. Um, instead, we landed on something entirely different, which is trial and error, figuring our stuff together through archaeology, which is a puzzle of our puns. Um, so the was a great success. Um, we now have a title moving 
forward. Um, and we're really pleased that this was developed through consultation with a younger audience of non-specialists. Non so it's really, really breathing in new life into the project. So following our swish rebrand of the project, uh, we designed our online survey, which our group of critical friends um, were provided with and gave us really useful feedback. So our critical friends are a group of 11 people from a variety of backgrounds, both within and outside of the sector, who provide us with light touch feedback, our consultation methods for puns too. Uh, and they'll inform, test and sense check project outputs uh, before they're circulated or enacted more widely. Um, where applicable, uh, they can represent the interests of their organisation or community, uh, and they really act as the kind of advocate for presenting the needs of different community groups and, and really are a very integral part of, of making sure Puns 2 really fits the needs of, of the sector. So that brings me to a very happy announcement um, that our survey as of today um, is now live. Um, and I strongly recommend uh, that you have your take part. Um, so you can actually scan the QR code. I don't know if it will work from a distance, but you can give it a go um, on the screen. Or you can visit our CBA standard hall. If you have any about the survey, uh, it's design, it's accessibility. Uh, please do leave comments in the section at the end of the survey because we're keen to hear your thoughts. Um, so this is just the first that we're taking um, as part of this project and we've got lots more public feedback yet to come through our workshops and uh, interviews. So if you'd like to keep updated about the project in any way, please do visit the CBA website and subscribe to our newsletter or you can follow us on social media um, or join the CBA as a member if you would like, which you can do from, from the hall. Um, so thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, and me, me and Zina decided we'd probably take questions at the very end of the session because I think that'd be a little bit easier. So, um, so yeah, thank you very much.